Welcome to the Unwashed Asses, episode 92, recorded for Monday, March 11th, 2019. The film festival continues! We, uh, we delved into Alfred Hitchcock's North by Northwest this week. Um, wasn't, I, I guess it was kind of intentional. The idea being, oh, well, we just saw Psycho and... Uh, not much else on the list is super appealing right now, so what, what do we got here? Oh, well, let's just continue with Hitchcock, and we'll see, because this was the film that had preceded Psycho, was released in uh, 1959, and uh, again, like the concept of the entire uh, series is, you know, largely hailed as one of the greatest movies of all time, uh, and, you know, contains such iconic scenes as the crop duster uh, chase and the uh, Mount Rushmore fight. Now, uh, North by Northwest was not a film that I had seen prior, but I was familiar with the scenes. I wasn't necessarily familiar with the concept of the movie, but, uh, you know, I was willing to give it a shot because that's that's what we're doing here. It's all about broadening horizons and and seeing, you know, what stacks up there and, and, and finding out how I can better be a better movie watcher. Unfortunately, this ended up being probably one of the worst movies I've ever seen. Uh, North by Northwest is a bloated, uh, convoluted mess of a film. Uh, the idea is that we have the character of... Um, uh, Ro- oh, God damn it, was it? Uh, Roger. Roger Thornhill, played by uh, Cary Grant who falls into a case of mistaken identity, uh, espionage, and uh, deceit, uh, trying to clear his name. Now, I have not seen a movie by Cary Grant, but of course I knew the movie, and yeah, he was a not necessarily a heartthrob, but definitely a leading man, and had quite a bit of respect. And after seeing the performance in North by Northwest, much like my opinions of the film itself, I was left bewildered uh, by... I don't understand why he was so well liked because not that there was really a likable character in this movie, but he was so unconvincing and so awkward. Awkward was the word that we kept coming back to. It was just uh, a bumbling mess of a performance. And it's it leaves me, you know, dumbfounded at how, uh, one, he would be lauded for his performance in this movie, but to have much of a career after it because it's just that bad. Uh, He's joined by co-stars Eva Marie Saint and James Mason, James Mason being another uh, name that I know uh, I've heard. And while Mason's performance was uh, not nearly as bad as Cary Grant, it wasn't anything really noteworthy. Um, Now, I realize as I'm saying this, I'm being a bit unfair because, you know, films of this time, the acting was a bit more stiff and I need to take that into context when when trying to re- review this movie, but it seems so unnatural to me in how the characters interact with one another. Um, in particular, when we have Cary Grant uh, meeting with his love interest, uh, even Marie Saint, he does this thing like... It, if you've ever seen uh, Talladega Nights, where Will Ferrell's character Ricky Bobby's being interviewed um, for the first time, and he keeps raising his hands up awkwardly, and you know, we'll even you know drop the quote, "Oh, I, I just I don't know what to do with my hands," and that's the it lasting impression that I got from Cary Grant while watching this, because in every scene with uh, Miss Saint, when they're supposed to be you know kiss- kissing passionately or interacting in a romantic uh, moment, his hands come up very slowly, almost seem to have a uh, tremor to them, and instead of like, you know, grasping her firmly or running his fingers through her hair, he just kind of like paws at the back of her head or will hold her with his forearms while keeping his fingers, you know, kind of wrecked like, Imagine a, a surgeon that's just scrubbed up for surgery and he's holding his hands aloft um, to have the gloves uh, put on. Or say you've just murdered a man and you have blood all over your hands and you've raised them up and you're looking at them bewildered. That's that's kind of what Cary Grant is doing here. And 
uh, the kissing is just so terribly forced and awkward between the two. And um, I'm actually curious now because there was no chemistry uh, between Grant and Saint. It was just so goddamn awkward. So he was born 1904. She was born 1924. So yeah, he had 20 years on her here. And it definitely shows. Because the, the character uh, played by Grant is, for whatever reason, portrayed as a bit of Loth uh, Lothario. He has charisma. He has... Uh, charm he has a way with the ladies and it's not at all convincing um he's i mean not necessarily an ugly man but he is overly tan and this was just you know a personal choice by Cary grant that's how he lived his life you know not constantly tanning himself but he sticks out like a sore thumb when compared to other uh characters in this movie none of them have a tan quite like his he walks with a bit of a hunch um not necessarily prominent, but you definitely notice it uh, when he's moving around and running, which there's a lot of that happening in this movie. And on top of it, he is just very, very wrinkled. Um, the high-waisted pants don't help. It's just overall, he is a very odd-looking man who moves very oddly and has no, in my opinion, sex appeal. And I don't understand why a woman 20 years his junior would be attracted to him. And that's the other bit, is that nothing is really portrayed super naturally. Uh, not to mean like ghosts and goblins and all that shit, but uh, emphasis. Nothing here is natural. Their interactions are all forced. And it's unbelievable and pulls me out of the movie while trying to watch it. Um, we have another scene... Just for example, where Cary Grant is um, escaping a hospital and he uh, manages to stumble into another patient's room where there's a woman there who's screaming, get out, get out, or um, some, not get out, uh, it doesn't matter because as soon as she puts on her glasses and sees him, she's like, oh no, stay, please stay, and it's, and it's awkward. It, it doesn't make sense because he's just not a naturally good-looking guy. Um, but let's get to the story. So, uh, it takes place in 1958. Uh, George, not George Kaplan, Roger Thornhill, uh, Grant's character, is uh, an ad executive. Um, the movie opens up with very, uh, I, I think impressive title sequence using card art and the way the, the credits roll across the screen before transitioning well into a, a shot of the New York skyline with you know skyscrapers and all that. We have a very busy scene where uh, Grant's character Thornhill is um, giving, not necessarily orders, but instructions to his secretary as they walk and talk in West Wing fashion. Uh, you know, they're walking towards the camera, camera's backing up, there's a lot of stuff going on, there's a lot of people around. It's a very action-oriented scene, and gives you this sense of importance and um, uh, action and, and life and activity. and uh, You feel, not necessarily frantic, but you, you're, you're caught up in it. Uh, they then take a, a cab to a hotel where... Um, Thornhill has a meeting before sending um, his secretary back to the office with, you know, orders to, or um, instructions to call his mother about some meeting they're going to have later. And this kind of sets up everything else in the rest of the movie because while um, sitting down with his clients, he remembers that, oh yeah, you know, my mother's not going to be where I told my secretary to call. Do you guys mind if I... Um, step aside to go send her, uh, send my secretary a telegraph to tell her where to contact my mother proper. And it's during this time that we're introduced to uh, the two goons. The goons themselves are um, henchmen of the film's antagonist, uh, it's James Mason's character of Philip Van Dam. Now, the, the mix-up here is that um, the thugs will grab uh, Thornhill and accuse him of being a man called George Kaplan and they, he needs to come with them. This was something that I had missed on my initial viewing of the movie and didn't catch until I was reading a plot synopsis um, because it happens so quickly and 
I was left wondering why they had confused him for this man, but apparently uh, a waiter calls for a man by the name of George Kaplan, and uh, Roger Thornhill then calls the waiter over to uh, help him send the telegram to his, his mother, or I'm sorry, to his secretary. So it's it's very clearly, okay, well now we have this this easily plausible case of mistaken identity, because the goons themselves have no idea what uh, George Kaplan looks like. He's um, he doesn't have a physical description because spoilers, he's he's not a real person. Uh, Thornhill is then taken to the estate of uh, uh, Townsend. I can't remember the first name. It's where they're. Um, while there, he's uh, introduced to um, James Mason's character who accuses him essentially of being a spy and they've been tracking his movements, they know where he's going and they want his help. They want him to essentially play a double agent all while um, Grant's character of Roger Thornhill is you know, denying all of it because you know he's clearly not this character. Now, up until this point, everything's been done. It's been executed very, very well. Um, I liked Grant's performance in in, uh, in the sense of, you know, denying wholeheartedly that he's not this George Kaplan character and he has no idea what's going on. He just wants to go home. He's willing to forget the whole thing happened. And he's much more, I guess, sensible about it than I would, you know, I would think I'd be in that situation where... He's, he's standing his ground. He's offering to show them his wallet with his uh, license and other identifying information. And he's trying to reason with them rather than just trying to get away. <coughs> and it could be that, you know, he's already tried to escape these people, but found that the car door was locked and he couldn't get away. So he's kind of stuck. And they've already brandished pistols and have threatened him several times. But um, it's at this point then that... Uh, he refuses to, to help them, and, um, uh, what the fuck is his name? I'm sorry, there's just so much that's going on here. Uh, Townsend then says to his cronies, oh, well, you know, fix him a drink, send him on his way, which is then code for stagey drunk driving accident to murder him. Uh, so they pour a whole bottle of bourbon into him, and, uh, they set him up to drive his car off a cliff, but... Lo and behold, we have uh, the miraculous driving scene of um, Thornhill as he evades his two captors and then manages to uh, catch the attention of local police where he's then arrested for drunk driving. And this was a part that I then began to get pulled out of the movie because... The entire driving sequence, I understand, were limited by the technology of the time, but just constant shots of clearly they have a car on a set with a green screen and we're show, being shown footage of um, sped up footage of a car driving through winding hills. And then we snap to cuts of uh, Grant's face, you know, awkwardly playing the drunk where he's got his suit collar popped up and he's making weird expressions. And it's just not at all believable. But again, for the time, this was kind of standard. Um, I was surprised though that you know Hitchcock didn't try to do things with more with um, lighting and having moving shots of the vehicle traveling around corners. I understand it's more of a modern film technique, but it seems kind of obvious. Um, and it's things like this where I don't I don't want to be too harsh on Hitchcock because. You know, clearly everything, for the most part, likes what he had done with Psycho. Um, but this movie just just smacks of laziness um, and complacency. We then deal, are uh, getting back to um, Thornhill in, in jail. He calls his, his uh, mother, who he tells her, you know, bring in my lawyer. We'll get this all cleared up. And we're introduced to his, 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 the character of his mother, who is just an outright bitch. And we don't have any real setup for this. We don't have any um, reason to... Uh, nothing's explained as to why she is so harsh and dismissive. Like, she clearly doesn't believe his story. Um, she thought, oh, yeah, he was just boozing again and, and, and got arrested. 
Um, but again, there's no setup for this. It's not believable. Um, but uh, his lawyer defends him well enough during the preliminary hearing. He explains the situation. The judge is like, all right, we'll take some detectives with you. Go back up to Townsend's Manor and, you know, let's figure out what happened there. So rather than just two detectives going up there to get the story, we have this mod squad of uh, the detectives, uh, Thornhill and his mother going up there where we find that uh, Townsend is, uh, he's not there. His wife is there and she plays the part uh, believably of, oh, we are having this party and Thornhill got drunk and he stole the neighbor's car and he drove home and we told him to stay here. And... Um, meanwhile, we have, uh, Thornhill, you know, opening up where the liquor cabinet was supposed to be, and it's just books, and, um, the stains on the couch from where the alcohol had been spilled aren't there, and he's just being portrayed as, as a crazy man. And this, again, Grant, when he's given, uh, subtle work like this, he does very well. It's very believable. I like his expressions, but anything action-related it starts to fall apart um, <clears throat> where it's not believable. It's not, I don't think he has that kind of range. Whereas if you're playing more of a, I don't know, a corporate thriller or maybe a um, judicial hearing, something like along the lines of law and order or something, I think he'd do very, very well. But anything that involves him getting out of essentially a very stiff, straight man um, role, he's not believable. Um, so we have... Uh, let's see, where were we? Were. Uh, sorry, I'm just reading through the synopsis here. So it's during this encounter that uh, Mrs. Townsend informs them that uh, Townsend proper is a UN diplomat. So is it this time he, uh, we find out, oh, it's just a $2 drunk driving fine and they let him go. It's like, why? I understand you want to clear your name and you might not want a criminal charge on your record, but they're super lax about the whole drunk driving thing to the point where his mother says, oh, just pay the $2 fine. It's like, if that's all it was, I would have just been like, here's the fucking money, you know, just fuck off, leave me alone. But I, again, we're, we don't have enough setup for um, Thornhill's character being a man of, um, I don't want to say prudence here, but integrity. There we go, integrity. To the point where he would go this far to clear his name. His mother's already painted the picture that he's been in trouble for drinking in the past. We know he's had a, at least one failed marriage. Maybe he is a guy who's trying to get his shit straight, but he's been painted as a bit of a clusterfuck. Um, at least based on character witnesses here. So we're getting mixed messages with the character. Uh, but yeah, they, he pays the fine, he's on his way, and then he goes back to the hotel, manages to dupe the um, hotel staff into letting him up into Kaplan's room, you know, like, I am George Kaplan. Um, it's at this point they start rooting around the guy's uh, room, he finds a suit where, oh yeah, this guy is way too small for me, he has dandruff, you know, I'm taller, I don't have dandruff, but they then get a... Um, phone call from the goons that are there to to kill him uh we get an awkward scene where uh they're in the, the elevator together and um thornhill tells his mother you know like these are the guys that are going to kill me and she just very loudly it asks them oh you guys aren't here to kill my son are you and everybody starts laughing and Again, it's just awkward. I understand it's a moment that's supposed to like break the tension, but it doesn't come across convincing. Uh, Thornhill manages to get away, and that's actually the last we're ever going to see of his mother. It, in a movie that runs over two hours long, introducing a person like this um, makes me curious as to why they did it, because it does nothing but add bloat to the movie. Um, she she served no other purpose than kind of discrediting her own son for reasons we aren't totally aware. 
And honestly, this is going to be the biggest issue I have with the movie is that it runs way too long. Yes, we have good setup, but eventually that starts wearing thin and we were left wondering when the fuck is this movie going to end? And getting rid of things like, you know, his mother would definitely have alleviated that because they're points that go nowhere, they waste the audience time, and they just ask us more questions that aren't going to be answered. So we have um, Thornhill goes to the UN, and um, this is actually an interesting bit of trivia. I guess uh, Hitchcock didn't have permission to film at the UN. So he had arranged uh, for a hidden camera to be set up across the street from the UN. They just had Cary Grant come in and do a taxi, exit and then walk up to the front entrance and that was their exterior establishing shot which i guess is you know kind of clever and then everything inside was just done on set but it's here that we um meet with the actual townsend who isn't the guy played by james mason as we already knew but wasn't established in the movie we then find out that mace um townsend is a widower and that people have been living in his house and they're definitely not him we cut to one of the goons throwing a knife, which then lands in Townsend's back, and Carrie, and, um, not Carrie Grant, well it is, but, um, Thornhill does the dumbest fucking thing I have ever seen. So again, we're in the UN, it's crowded, there's a lot of people around. Townsend gets stabbed in the back by a throwing knife, Grant catches him, and before screaming for help or doing anything logical he immediately grabs the knife pulls it out of the guy's back and then is photographed by a journalist as you know, oh he just murdered a un diplomat so much of this could have just kind of gone away had the character of uh thornhill not been written as an absolute fucking idiot um so then he's he's on the run. We have the, the beginning of the chase, which is going to last the rest of the movie. Um, I'm just tired already talking about this movie. <laughs> uh, Thornhill runs. He makes it to a train and is then helped by a woman named Eve, played by uh, Eve, Eva Marie Saint. And for reasons that, again, aren't made abundantly clear, uh, in, at least at the time, just like, oh, is she drawn to his raw animal sex, sex appeal? We don't know. But she hides him away in her cabin. Um, uh, Thornhill then uh, meets with her several times. They have dinner where, you know, they're talking very very provocatively about just straight up fucking and it when i consider the movie at its time period it's kind of like what they did in psycho it's like okay well hitchcock was clearly about breaking boundaries and, and pushing limits and i was wasn't necessarily taken aback but surprised at how open they were about um just pretty much boning and if i can find the quote here um because they had dubbed out one of her lines um because it was too risque um let's see here ba -ba 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 -ba. this is just a fucking wonderful show because i feel like i'm so all over the place with it um okay uh, so one of Eva Marie Saint's lines in the dining car section was redubbed. She originally said, I never make love on an empty stomach, but it was changed in post-production to, I never discuss love on an empty stomach. And as a censored, considered the original version too risque. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, again, a very sexually charged conversation. And their purported intimacy is not it's not believable i don't understand what her appeal to him would be um from that sense of things we then later find you know she ends up being a spy who's working for van damme but she's actually a double agent who's working with the cia because the cia had created this character of kaplan to kind of throw off van damme and get the microfilm that he's trying to smuggle out of the country 
Yes, there's all of that going on. <sighs> Essentially, we have a big, long chase sequence of... Um, I'm just going to drop the names all together here. Yeah, well, no, fuck it. Consistency. Consistency. Thornhill is being led around by Eve as she's purportedly making contact with this Kaplan character. He's under the impression that he's going to clear his name while she's working Van Dam and uh, trying to, you know, essentially set up uh, Thornhill as Kaplan. They go to Chicago. She says, oh, well, he'll meet you at a bus station outside of town, which the shot that they use here, because it's in the middle of fucking nowhere, which is actually works well for Illinois, but to get to middle of nowhere, Illinois from Chicago is going to take you at least an hour, hour and a half. I think they covered that when he was getting the ticket. It was just bizarre. You'd think if you're going to meet with a spy or, you know, meet with somebody, you're going to do it a bit closer rather than driving, you know, an hour and a half out of your way to go talk to the middle of nowhere. And then this is where we get the iconic scene of the crop duster chase. And um, Empire Magazine in 2009 had sold or, or had lauded this as the most iconic scene in film of all time. And or was it the most iconic? I want to get this right here. Ba ba ba. Reading stuff and making you sit and wait. Da da ba ba. Um. Fuck, where is it? Sorry, the uh. The uh. Garbage truck is here and. Fucking my shit up. Mm, where? This is aggravating that I can't find this. Mm. Hmm. Mm, where is it? Anywho. Yeah, I'm, I'm aggravated. I can't find that. Anywho, they're like, oh yeah, it's the greatest thing since sliced bread. And, um... And it's not. It, it, I don't understand how much... How this movie garnered so much critical acclaim. Because the chase sequence in the cornfield... One, it's not even a cornfield. There are empty fields every fucking where. Like, this is clearly taking place late in the harvest. We don't even have stalks in the ground. There is a patch of corn which is dried up, wilted. Like this is the stuff that you would, you know, bundle together as part of like Halloween decorations. We have Cary Grant, again, anytime he's forced into an action role, it is unbelievable. Uh, it's, it, he's, he's not good. Uh, he runs around like a hunched old man trying to find the bathroom in the middle of the night and awkwardly uh, stumbles like a newborn gazelle into the cornfield. And I don't understand the appeal of this scene because it's not riveting. It's not gripping. It doesn't move me in any way. It just pulls me again further out of the movie because of such a terrible performance. So he baits the uh, crop duster into crashing into a truck because he runs out in the middle of the road, stops the truck, and the crop duster, rather than pulling up, just slams into the side of it. He then takes the opportunity to steal one of the stop vehicles. That you're like, oh, there's a bunch of gawkers. They're going to go out and look, and he just steals a truck. Then goes back to Chicago, um, talks to you. He's like, the fuck you doing? And then gets real rapey with her. Like, not actual rape, but... He has developed an unnatural interest in her, and it does. I guess it's supposed to come off as, you know, heartthrob esh, but it's just pretty much, no, you're gonna stay with me here, we're gonna do this, and why don't you like me? It's like when a guy gets super clingy with a girl, say they've broken up. She's already stated explicitly, you know, in this scenario and in the movie, 
And she wants nothing more to do with him. He's like, well, what about if, you know, we just have dinner one last time? Well, while we're waiting for my clothes to get clean, what do you think we can do in 20 minutes? And it's super fucking cringy. So she baits him into, you know, going into the shower and then she leaves because she has to meet Van Damme's character. Um, we then, you know, see that, uh, uh, what's his tits? <laughs> You'd think I'd have the names down. Thornhill uh, follows her, meets her and Van Dam at an auction, and then seeing that the two of them are together, Thornhill proceeds to have a fucking meltdown and loses his shit, um, essentially calling her a whore. It's like, it's heavily implied that she slept with you on the train, and uh, as I already said, she wants nothing to do with you, and... You see her with another guy, and you just proceed to kind of lose your shit. It's, again, super fucking awkward. So Van Damme and Eve leave. Um, Eve leave. And uh, Van Damme's goons are then getting ready to kill uh, uh, Thornhill. But Thornhill makes a scene at the auction, getting himself arrested again. It's... Um, while the uh, officers arrest him and he's sitting in the car, he's like, oh, by the way, you know, you guys kind of got yourselves uh, super lucky here because I'm the guy who murdered the guy in the UN uh, back in New York. You know, take me to the police station. And they're like, hot diggity damn. All right, they call it in. And instead of going to the police station, though, they're going to take him back to, uh, they're going to drop him off at a special location where we get the Northwest Airlines. Um, title itself is a bit of a misnomer. It was a working title, and apparently they never came up with anything better, so it just stuck. But um, I guess North by uh, what is it here? Uh, North by Northwest isn't even an actual cardinal point on a compass. It would be Northwest by North. Um, but you have to admit it; it rolls off the tongue. So the cops drop him off at the airport, and it's there that we meet the head of the CIA, who begins explaining everything to Thornhill, that Eve's a double agent, and that she's risked everything to keep him safe up to this point, and they want his help in stopping Van Damme. Um, Thornhill initially disagrees, but is then essentially, and again, a very rapey kind of way, is promised, oh, well, you help us with this, and she'll be yours like, you guys, you'll have my blessing. You can go do whatever you want. And I guess, again, we're supposed to be under the impression that these two are actually in love and they want to be together. But I feel like I'm beating a dead horse with this when I say it over and over again. It's just not believable. But I can't emphasize that point enough. It's not... It's not good. Um... So they head out to uh, Mount Rushmore, where Van Damme is planning on leaving, but uh, he's already suspicious of Eve as being a double agent. So they uh, arrange a meeting where they um, uh, work out that Eve will uh, shoot Thornhill with a blank, thus proving her allegiance to Van Damme and getting um, Thornhill kind of out of the picture. Um, but on the way back to the hospital, they meet up with Eve in the woods, you know, and it's revealed to Thornhill that, oh, no, she's actually going to go fly off of Van Damme and continue being a, a worthwhile spy. And the head of the CIA lied to him, which, you know, shocking. And again, we get more of rapey Cary Grant, uh, essentially asserting his dominance over a woman that doesn't necessarily want to be all that, uh, hooked up with him. At least that's what the body language and the performance suggests to me, but it's not what the story wants you to believe. Um, so he's like, no, run away with me, don't go do your thing, and then CIA agent man has a park ranger clock Cary Grant in the fucking face, and they take him back to the hospital where he's supposed to stay there for the next several days to make it believable. Yeah, he actually died. Which then... Thornhill lies, escapes the hospital, and heads back up to Van Damme's uh, mountain retreat overlooking the majestic Mount Rushmore, which is unbelievable that on government land they would allow a house to be built that close. He snal uh, solid snakes his way into the house, uh, leaves a message for Eve that, oh yeah, 
By the way, I overheard a conversation between the Van Damme and one of his goons that they found out the gun's a blank and they're going to murder your ass while over at the Atlantic. Uh, run away with me. Well, one thing leads to another, and we're on top of Mount Rushmore, and we have Cary Grant and Eva Marie Saint uh, bouldering over Mount Rushmore, climbing down Lincoln's nose in fucking uh, heels and loafers. And we have, again, just terrible acting all around, um, god-awful screams, and... Just overall terrible performances. Uh, nothing's believable. We have one of the goons fall to his death. We have another as he's, uh, you know, just about to dispose of Thornhill and Eve, get shot by a park ranger, and lo and behold, in Deus Ex Machina fashion, the head of the CIA standing on top of uh, Jefferson's head with some park rangers, Van Dam's in cuffs there. And we have Thornhill then pulling up Eve. Smash cut to them on the train. He's calling her Mrs. Thornhill. And uh, we then get a suggestive shot of a train going into a tunnel. Legit, that's how it ends. It is god awful. It's like they had built up so much momentum and got lost all along the way and then realized they had to end the movie because it was already over two hours long. And rather than build up to a climax and then ease back down into a nice epilogue, they're like, oh shit, climax, smash cut, epilogue, done. And it's awful. Like so much of the rest of the movie, it is awful. It's a thing where we could have easily cut out 45 minutes, trimmed everything up, arranged the pacing to get nice, even storytelling motions, and Hitchcock throws it all out the fucking window and leads it up, you know, kind of closes things up with a super suggestive shot that is laughable. It is fucking laughable. But somehow it holds a 99% approval rating on Rotten Tomatoes. Uh, it was ranked number 98 in Empire Magazine's list of the 500 greatest movies of all time. New York Times says it's a critic's pick and it's uh, the most scenic, intriguing, and merriest chase. So many people laud this movie and for reasons I cannot begin to fathom. I wasn't expecting expecting this uh, in watching again purportedly the greatest movies of all time but it reminds me again that everybody has different opinions and apparently i'm the outlier in this um because it is just a, a fucking pile of garbage from top to bottom uh, it starts off strong but then quickly doesn't even get full of itself it just tries to shoehorn so much stuff into one movie that doesn't need it and it fails miserably on all accounts because of this so yeah definitely uh avoid this one it's it's not good but uh that's gonna wrap it up uh if you have your own thoughts on north by northwest if you've seen it or any other thing you really want to talk about shoot me an email over at the unwashed asses at gmail.com and of course this year uh all we ask help the show grow tell a friend let them know they can get it wherever they get the podcasts and, uh, yeah, we'll talk to you next time.